Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to our weekly explain session. Under this series, every Friday at 8 p.m., we have been covering an important current affairs topic which was in news over the last one week. And we have been discussing this in complete detail in order to help you prepare for UPSC civil services examination. So today, we have chosen an important topic from environment and ecology. This week, there was an important development related to the ongoing recovery of the ozone layer. So in today's session, we shall understand this topic comprehensively so that you don't need any other source to prepare for UPSC exams. Before we proceed, why don't you support us by pressing the like button, sharing your comments below and without fail, subscribing to our channel. So let's start with the discussion and understand why this topic is in news. What's the context? Just a few days back, a UN body a scientific assessment panel which is backed by the United Nations that is associated with the Montreal Protocol brought out a very important report. According to this report, the damage which had occurred to the ozone layer is being repaired. We are able to reconstruct the ozone layer by eliminating the ozone depleting substances which had led to the formation of the ozone hole in the first place particularly in the polar areas, especially in the Antarctic. The ozone concentration levels had depleted due to man-made activities, due to anthropogenic activities. So this damage which had happened to the ozone layer was posing a very serious threat for the very survival of life on Earth. So we have been able to recover the ozone layer thanks to right intervention, which has happened under the Montreal Protocol. The entire credit goes to the implementation of the Montreal Protocol by all the signatories to it, the world has been able to phase out these harmful ozone depleting substances. And according to this assessment report, almost 99% of the damage which was caused to the ozone layer is going to be repaired in the coming decades. In the next 30 to 40 years, we will, we will get to witness an almost complete recovery of the ozone layer. So this is a very, very important development as far as environment and ecology is concerned. So that's why we have to understand this topic in complete detail. So today, we shall first understand what is ozone? What constitutes ozone? How is it formed? We shall understand the role of the ozone layer. We will talk about ozone depletion in complete detail and understand what is the Montreal Protocol and how did this protocol become successful? What is the end result? And how is it that we put the ozone layer back on the recovery path? These are some important points to discuss, which will help you cover a number of facts for prelims, along with the required analysis for any mains question. So let's start by understanding what is ozone. Ozone is a molecule which is made up of three oxygen atoms and is represented by the chemical formula O3. Ozone can be found not just in the higher reaches of the atmosphere, but it can also be found closer to the ground level. So ozone can be present either high up in the atmosphere, particularly in the stratosphere. You can see here in the image that in the stratosphere, which is right above the troposphere, roughly around 10 or 15 kilometers above the Earth's surface, going all the way up to 30 to 50 kilometers above the Earth's surface. This entire band or region of the atmosphere is made up of the ozone layer. So this is something that's referred to as stratospheric ozone. That is ozone present in the stratosphere, in the higher reaches of the atmosphere. At the same time, ozone can also be found at ground level, very close to the surface of the earth. So depending on the ozone where it is present in the atmosphere, it can play a different role. Ground level ozone especially can be extremely harmful to human beings. The ozone which is present closer to the surface is actually a toxic pollutant. Especially in cities, in urban industrial areas where you have vehicular and industrial pollution, where there is a lot of nitrous oxide and volatile organic compound emissions you get to witness the formation of ground level ozone, which is a toxic pollutant. It is extremely harmful 
to humans, plants and even other animals. It can lead to respiratory disorders, respiratory issues. It can harm the lung tissue. It can cause very serious damage to plants and other life forms as well. So ground level ozone can be harmful. But at the same time, the same ozone present in the stratosphere is life saving. In fact, the ozone layer found here in the stratosphere is one of the prime re reasons behind why life exists on earth. This is where we need to understand the role of the ozone layer. So the presence of this layer was first discovered by French physicists Charles Fabry and Henri Buisson in 1913. Further studies helped us understand the critical role that ozone plays in the stratosphere. So let's understand what is this important role played by ozone. The ozone layer absorbs harmful radiation from the sun particularly the UV radiation or ultraviolet radiation. If all the frequencies of UV radiation, if they were to reach the earth, the surface of the earth, then probably life on earth wouldn't exist. Because harmful UV radiation, especially the short wave high energy UV radiation, such as UVB and also UVC, they are extremely harmful and they can damage tissue, they can even affect the DNA in the genetic structure. It can lead to skin cancer. It can damage plant tissue as well. And is extremely harmful not just to human beings, but also to all life forms on earth. So this harmful UV radiation is blocked by the ozone layer and it prevents these harmful radiations from reaching the surface of the earth. This is the critical role played by the ozone layer in the stratosphere. You can see in the image as well, these short wave high energy UV radiation such as UVC is almost 100% absorbed by the ozone layer present in the stratosphere. And UVB, which is also extremely harmful to humans and primarily responsible for skin cancer and tissue damage, gets almost absorbed entirely by the ozone layer. So this critical function of the ozone layer is responsible for the existence, the emergence and survival of life on earth. So let's understand how ozone is performing this function. See at any given point of time, ozone molecules, that is O3 molecules, they are constantly getting created and parallelly they are constantly getting destroyed in the stratosphere. This is a constant cyclical reaction which is taking place in the stratosphere. This constant creation and destruction of ozone is referred to as the Chapman cycle. This together, the formation of ozone and the destruction of ozone, which is happening parallelly, simultaneously, is referred to as the Chapman cycle. So in the Chapman cycle, you have an oxygen molecule, an O2 molecule, which absorbs a photon. It's basically a photolytic reaction, which takes place under the influence of radiation, solar radiation. It absorbs the harmful short wave UV radiation and splits into two oxygen atoms. These single oxygen atoms will now interact with the oxygen molecule, which is readily available and will absorb another range of harmful UV radiation and forms the ozone molecule. So this is the formation process. It's a photolytic reaction. Similarly, there is a destruction cycle as well that's happening parallelly. Every ozone molecule gets destroyed again by absorbing the harmful UV radiation and this reaction produces an oxygen molecule and an oxygen atom. And this cycle continues. So there is a natural equilibrium in the stratosphere. There is a constant balance between the creation of ozone and the destruction of ozone. If you take away any human influence, if you exclude any other external influence on this cycle, there will be a constant formation of ozone, that is creation of ozone on one side and a constant destruction happening on the other side. So naturally, there is an equilibrium in this cycle and this cycle is referred to as the Chapman cycle. So as a result, there is a thick concentration of ozone in this layer and it is absorbing the harmful UV rays 
thus protecting life on earth. Now, if imagine there were to be an external event which influences or disrupts the Chapman cycle, then what would happen? If some event or if some development were to disrupt the constant creation and destruction of ozone, then imagine the consequences of this. If the cycle is disrupted, you might witness a situation where the destruction of ozone will accelerate. Ozone will start getting destroyed at a faster rate. The destruction phase of the cycle will accelerate. And since it will overtake the rate of creation of ozone, you will start witnessing the thinning of the ozone layer. Is that clear? You will see a decline in the ozone level concentration. And this is what we refer to as the ozone hole. So technically, it's not a hole exactly. What we refer to as the ozone hole is actually ozone depletion. It's a depletion of the ozone concentration that's happening at this level of the stratosphere. There is a thinning of the ozone layer because of acceleration in the destruction cycle and a slowdown in the creation cycle. So if such an external event were to influence the Chapman cycle and lead to this disruption, you will witness a thinning of the ozone layer, which we refer to as the ozone hole. So this will allow the harmful UV rays to penetrate the atmosphere and reach the surface of the earth, thereby making life on earth almost impossible. So we humans have indeed contributed to such an event. Anthropogenic activities, industrial activities led by humans has been directly responsible for disrupting the Chapman cycle. Is that clear? Because the ozone that we were talking about, if this were to interact with free radicals, such as let's say chlorine free radical or a bromine free radical, these free radicals, if they were to be present at these higher reaches of the atmosphere, and if they were to interact with ozone, right, if they were to interact with the oxygen molecule, the oxygen atom, and the ozone molecule, these free radicals can act as a catalyst and they can break the Chapman cycle and they can permanently disrupt the equilibrium in the creation and destruction of ozone. Unfortunately, a few industrial activities have contributed to the release of these free chlorine and bromine radicals which have reached the higher stratosphere and they have indeed disrupted the Chapman cycle. According to a study conducted by the US Environmental Protection Agency, one chlorine atom can destroy more than one lakh ozone molecules before it degrades and, de and it starts reducing or declining from the stratosphere, before it gets removed permanently from the stratosphere. These free radicals can have a longer shelf life. They can remain in the higher atmosphere for a long period and contribute to frequent destruction of ozone, which will end up disrupting the Chapman cycle. So let's clearly understand the industrial process that is responsible for this. And when exactly did we figure out that we were depleting the ozone layer? The initial research regarding this came up in 1980s. It was at the start of 1980s that few scientists, researchers, they figured out that harmful UV radiation was indeed sneaking through the atmosphere and reaching the surface of the earth. Further studies revealed the emergence of an ozone hole, particularly in the polar areas, especially in the South Pole, that is in the Antarctic. So this research would conclusively establish the role of few industrial emissions which are referred to as CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons and HCFCs, hydrochlorofluorocarbons. These industrial emissions were directly held responsible for the release of free chlorine radicals into the stratosphere, which was directly disrupting and breaking the Chapman cycle, thus leading to the thinning of the ozone layer. So by mid-1980s, this became very, very clear. It was backed by scientific evidence. Because researchers were noting a sharp drop 
in the thickness, in the concentration of ozone in this reach or in these higher reaches of the stratosphere. All right. So where do these emissions come from? In which industries do we find the application of CFCs and HCFCs? These chemicals were primarily used in the refrigeration, cooling and air conditioning industry along with being used in aerosols, paints and few furniture industries. The primary application of CFCs and HCFCs was as a cooling agent in the refrigeration cooling industry. So refrigerators, air conditioners, etc. They were all manufactured using these industrial chemicals. And eventually the emissions from this industry along with emissions from paint, aerosols and furniture industry would release the free chlorine radicals which would eventually reach the upper reaches of the stratosphere. Atmospheric currents would drive them towards the stratosphere, push them towards the polar areas as well. And this was acting as a catalyst. These free radicals were catalyzing the breakdown of ozone and they were disrupting the Chapman cycle. Let me explain the process of this destruction. Let us see how the catalytic destruction of ozone takes place. Now, if a free chlorine radical is introduced into the Chapman cycle, that is in the stratosphere, if you can imagine, there is one cycle where ozone is constantly getting created. There is one more parallel cycle where ozone is constantly getting destroyed. So this is a natural equilibrium which is maintained. Because of human activities, if a free chlorine radical is introduced, this will take away the single oxygen atom. The free chlorine radical will break up this cycle, the Chapman cycle. It will take away the single oxygen atom and it will end up breaking the entire creation and destruction process as you can see in this image and in the reactions represented over here. Is that clear? The formation and destruction of ozone can get disrupted as the free chlorine radical takes away the single oxygen atom and it directly contributes to a permanent destabilization of the Chapman cycle. So these substances that were contributing to the destruction of the Chapman cycle, they were referred to as ozone depleting substances. Is that clear? The primary culprit here was the refrigerant and cooling industry along with few other industries where CFCs, HCFCs were widely used around the world, especially in developed nations, developed countries. So immediately the global community got together to work out a solution to deal with this problem. This was a pressing challenge for the global community and it brought together countries to address this environmental problem and to work out a global solution to deal with this. Is that clear? So let's see how the formation of the ozone hole accelerated particularly in the polar areas and why does the formation of this ozone hole particularly occur in the Antarctic? That's an obvious question that would have popped in your mind. If the Chapman cycle can be disrupted by free chlorine radicals, why doesn't it occur over the tropics or over the temperate region? Why does it occur in the polar areas such as Arctic and Antarctic? And why specifically the ozone hole is larger in the Antarctic as compared to the Arctic? There should be some reason behind it. Let me explain this. See, in the 1980s, when researchers were looking out for the depletion of ozone, they figured out that the depletion was maximum at the South Pole, that is over the Antarctic. They also noted a depletion over the years in the North Pole as well in the Arctic. But the ozone hole, the extent of it was much larger in the Antarctic as compared to the Arctic. The reason why it occurs mainly in the polar areas, especially in the Antarctic, is because of the unique mythological conditions that are present in the polar areas. Because for the catalytic reaction that I was talking about, for that catalytic reaction to occur, where a free chlorine radical takes away the single oxygen atom, for this reaction to occur, there are certain unique mythological conditions that are needed. You need a unique temperature, pressure, wind speed and wind direction conditions which prevails only in the polar areas and specifically in the Antarctic. In the Antarctic, also in the Arctic, you witness a cyclonic condition called the polar vortex, which gets triggered 
usually in the winter season. That is when the sun sets for almost six months in the polar areas, it triggers a cyclonic condition due to the changes in atmospheric conditions called the polar vortex, which you see here in the image. This polar vortex, which establishes a cyclonic circulation over the Antarctic, traps all the air, the wind within the vortex and you see a significant drop in temperature within the polar region because it has basically insulated and cut off the Antarctic from the rest of the atmosphere, from the rest of the world, basically from the temperate tropical areas. So the exchange of heat gets limited and within the polar vortex, there is a significant drop in temperature. As the temperature drops, the condensation results in the formation of a unique cloud called the polar stratospheric clouds. Polar stratospheric clouds are formed in the polar areas, both in Arctic and Antarctic. And the free chlorine radicals, which we have emitted, they will start depositing on these clouds. Because for the catalytic reaction to occur, you need extremely low temperatures. And this is again a photolytic reaction. It requires the presence of sunlight. So during the winter season in polar areas, when there is no sunlight, the free radicals keep accumulating over this cold surface of the polar stratospheric clouds. And as soon as the summer season starts, particularly in the months of September, October, November, going all the way till January, during the season, with sunlight, the catalytic reaction gets triggered where the free chlorine radical breaks the Chapman cycle and you will start witnessing a thinning of the ozone because the creation and destruction process has been disrupted and you will witness a thinning of the ozone layer. This explains why it primarily occurs in polar areas, not over tropics or temperate region. But why does it occur more over Antarctic as compared to the Arctic? It's because these unique meteorological conditions that is the intensity of the polar vortex, the extent to which polar stratospheric clouds are formed, the low temperature conditions, they exist in ideal conditions in the Antarctic as compared to the Arctic. The polar vortex in the Arctic is weaker compared to the strong polar vortex in the Antarctic. In the Antarctic, you find a more extensive formation of polar stratospheric clouds as compared to the Arctic. That is the reason why the ozone hole is limited in its extent in the Arctic, it also recovers quite quickly as compared to the Antarctic. Now, if you look at the satellite images over here, ever since we found out about the depletion of ozone and we started mapping it, you see that by 1980s, there was a significant thinning of the ozone layer. By 1990s, this had expanded further. There was a major increase in the depleted concentration levels of ozone. This would continue increasing until early 2000. But in the last 20 years, we have reversed this. Because of direct intervention through Montreal Protocol, we have reversed the expansion of the ozone hole. We have arrested it. And today, we have put the ozone layer back on the path of recovery. Because don't forget, the Chapman cycle is a constant cycle. If you are able to take away this catalyst, if you are able to take away the free chlorine radicals, eliminate them completely, you will bring this destruction process to an end. You will, you will be able to restore that balance in the Chapman cycle where ozone will get created and destroyed simultaneously, thereby restoring balance and bringing back normality, normalcy to the ozone layer. Is that clear? So this is where the Montreal Protocol has been absolutely critical. As soon as the world realized the threat in mid-1980s, a global convention was held in 1985 called the Vienna Convention. The Vienna Convention was focused on protecting the ozone layer from these harmful ozone depleting substances. This laid the framework, a global framework, to work out an agreement or a protocol through which countries can commit to phase out and eliminate these ozone depleting substances. So following the Vienna Convention, the Montreal Protocol was worked out in 1987. This protocol would come into force in 1989. And today we have every country in the world, every UN member state, which has signed and ratified this important treaty. This is one of the only and unique treaties in the world, which has universal membership. Every country, every UN member state 
they have signed and ratified it and they are implementing it very very seriously because the countries know the consequences of failing to achieve these targets now see you can't go for a complete elimination of these ozone depleting substances immediately because these are vital industries refrigeration cooling air conditioning these are vital industries for the economy you can't simply end or ban these chemicals overnight so the only approach you can take here the practical approach is to phase out these chemicals to gradually reduce the utilization of these chemicals and replacing them with safer alternatives so montreal protocol mandated that every country would move away from these ozone depleting substances they would stop using cfcs hfcs in a phased manner and instead replace it with a non ozone depleting substance that is hfcs or hydrofluorocarbon so this was a safer alternative because hfcs do not contribute the free chlorine radical thereby does not contribute to the destruction of the ozone layer so montreal protocol placed a greater responsibility on the developed countries first the rich developed nations which were primarily responsible for these emissions they were given the mandate to phase out cfcs and hfcs with a more relaxed deadline for developing and small countries is it clear so developed nations the western countries industrialized nations they started phasing out cfcs hfcs from 1989 itself other large countries developing economies emerging nations including india started pitching later then the smaller countries the poor low developed or least developed countries would also take up these commitments and over the last last 40 years every country has seriously implemented these changes in their industries so gradually we are phasing out cfcs hfcs and today we are reliant on hfcs or hydrofluorocarbons so the latest assessment report which was brought out this week has pointed out that since montreal protocol came into force we have achieved a near 99% reduction in the usage of cfcs and hcfcs meaning we have almost eliminated the usage of these ozone depleting substances this is the true success of montreal protocol and it happens to be one of the first international agreements which has seen such universal global success but however the montreal protocol had a shortcoming it had a drawback so before i discuss the shortcoming let me also tell you that montreal protocol provided for finance and technology as well it mandated the developed nations which had a greater responsibility to assist the developing nations and the poor countries by giving them finance and the technology needed to shift from ozone depleting substances to non ozone depleting substances the finance component was very critical because not every country can afford such a sudden shift in the industry without bearing economic and financial losses also the technology needed to shift to a safer alternative so developed countries were given a target here as well to assist the developing nations and the smaller countries by providing the required finance and technology this is where montreal protocol stood out and in a way it played a great role in ensuring that the protocol becomes a success but the only shortcoming of montreal protocol is that the alternative which was decided upon that is hfcs which is a non ozone depleting substance unfortunately turned out to be a very very dangerous greenhouse gas a very potent greenhouse gas it's extremely dangerous as a greenhouse gas because its global warming potential is many thousand times higher than that of carbon dioxide if you take one molecule of carbon dioxide and measure the global warming potential of co2 with that of one molecule of hfc you will find that hfc is many thousand times more potent in trapping and capturing heat as compared to one molecule of co2 its global warming potential is many many times higher thereby making it a deadly greenhouse gas basically it would contribute to climate change and if we are continued on this path of montreal protocol hfcs alone might have contributed to a rise in temperature of around 0.5 degrees celsius by 2050 now
Now, this is something we can't afford because parallelly, we have the Climate Change Convention under which we have the Paris Agreement through which we are trying to limit the global rise in temperatures to under 2 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. If possible, we are trying to limit the rise in temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius. If HFCs alone contribute to a rise of nearly 0.5 degrees Celsius, it is going to derail our climate action efforts. So that is why immediate intervention was carried out. And in 2016, the Montreal Protocol was amended. Montreal Protocol has been amended several times to make changes with regard to deadlines and the alternatives. But the 2016 amendment, which was done in Kigali, right? So it's called the Kigali Amendment, is a crucial amendment because it mandates all the countries to phase out HFCs as well by 2047. In the next 20-30 years, you will see a phasing out of HFCs as well because it is a dangerous greenhouse gas. When it was adopted under the Montreal Protocol, it was safe because it was non-ozone depleting. Compared to CFCs, HFCs, it was not contributing to ozone depletion. But the problem is, it is a dangerous greenhouse gas. It can contribute to a significant rise in temperature, which defeats our fight against climate change. That's why it was absolutely essential to phase out HFCs as well. And for this, the Kigali Amendment was introduced to the Montreal Protocol. So accordingly, developed countries have started phasing out HFCs. They've already started replacing HFCs with other alternatives, which are not just non-ozone depleting, but it is also not a greenhouse gas. It will not contribute to climate change. So safer alternatives are being brought in with advances in technology. And developing nations and underdeveloped countries have been given an extended window to start phasing out HFCs. This again shows the division of responsibilities, the distribution of responsibilities. Because developed countries, they share a bigger burden when it comes to industrial pollution, climate change, global warming, depletion of ozone, etc. So developed nations are given more stricter targets. So they have already started phasing out HFCs, whereas developing and other countries will get an extended window and they will start phasing out HFCs very soon. The goal is to achieve a 80 to 85 percent reduction in HFC usage by 2047. Recently, India has ratified the Kigali Amendment. In 2021, the Union Cabinet approved India's ratification to Kigali Am Amendment. And India is going to start implementing these provisions. And we will start phasing out HFCs as well. We will contribute to these global efforts, just like we played a big role in Montreal Protocol as well. So this is the reason why today we are witnessing the recovery of the ozone layer. After nearly 30 plus years of implementation of Montreal Protocol and almost 99% elimination of CFCs and HCFCs, we have managed to limit the free chlorine radicals in the stratosphere and the latest research conducted by this scientific assessment panel has shown that in the coming 30 to 40 years, you will see a complete recovery of the ozone, almost complete recovery of the ozone. The study says that the ozone layer will come back to 1980 levels. And you will see this happening by 2066 over the South Pole, over the Antarctic, by 2045 over the Arctic, and by 2040 in other parts of the world. Is that clear? So in the coming decades, you will see a complete recovery of the ozone almost back to 1980 levels, which would mark the success of Montreal Protocol and also the Kigali Amendment. So this is the big success the global community has achieved. And the report which has confirmed these, these progresses that we have made is a massive achievement in the field of environment and ecology. It offers lessons in the field of climate change as well. Because according to studies conducted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, even the elimination of CFCs and HCFCs have helped in mitigating global temperatures by at least 0.5 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, if ozone destruction had continued, even that would have contributed to global warming, which would have increased the temperatures by 0.5 degrees Celsius. 
So Montreal Protocol has played an important role in not just protecting the ozone layer, but also in limiting global warming. However, in this report, there is one important note of caution. The researchers who brought out this scientific assessment, they have pointed out few concerns about a technology known as geoengineering. Geoengineering is a futuristic technology in which the geography of the earth itself is engineered in order to tackle climate change. There are many innovative futuristic methods which are suggested under geoengineering. The idea is to reflect the solar insulation or the sunlight to limit the insulation that we are receiving through artificial methods so that you can reduce the heating up of the Earth's atmosphere artificially. The other method is to remove the excess carbon. That is carbon sequestration basically. So carrying out these changes in the geography of the Earth is geoengineering. So artificially reducing solar insulation by putting up space mirrors or by spraying aerosols, reflective aerosols in the stratosphere. These are examples of geoengineering. Spraying these reflective aerosols is called stratospheric aerosol injection. These are very minute particles. It's a particulate matter which is very very minute in size. They are reflective in nature. They can reflect the excess solar light thereby reducing insulation and thereby keeping the temperatures under control. The other geoengineering method is to remove the excess carbon, remove the greenhouse gases from the atmosphere through sequestration. This requires large scale changes in the very geography of the earth itself and this technology is called geoengineering where we are trying to engineer the geography of the earth itself. So under this technology, this method especially is of concern as far as ozone protection is concerned. Because the spraying of these reflective aerosols, they might adversely affect the ozone layer and the Chapman cycle. We don't have enough studies to show the impact of stratospheric aerosol injection. If we were to spray these reflective aerosols in the stratosphere to reflect the excess sunlight and thereby tackle climate change, you never know what consequences it might have on other factors in the stratosphere, particularly in the ozone layer. This might adversely affect the creation and destruction of ozone, that is the Chapman cycle, and it could also destabilize the natural processes, the equilibrium that we find in the ozone layer. So this report has cautioned the world with regard to geoengineering technologies such as stratospheric aerosol injection. Because this is one potential technology which has the ability to reverse all the gains we have made with regard to ozone protection. Alright? So the, on this note of caution, the scientific report has pointed out that we have been able to recover the ozone layer in the coming decades you will witness an almost complete recovery which marks the success of the Montreal Protocol. So on this note, I would like to bring my discussion to an end. I hope it was a fruitful, productive discussion. So do let me know how the session went in the comments below. Do support us by liking the video and also don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.